I'm Zarvan Ossia and I'm from the ICRC field delegate. Thank you very much. Actually, my question is for Professor Sharkey. And uh, you hesitated before when you said drones think but know the word and then you went back to think. I'm comforted by the fact that uh, the lawyer side of it, of the panel, is saying that, you know, at the end of the day, the law is there. We just need to work on it, develop it, clarify it. I've seen what we've done with uh, interpretative guidance on direct participation to hostilities, and I believe that is an exemplary uh, proof of what we can do with what we have, and probably dates back not 150 years, but to the very beginning of mankind and, and, and of war. But then my question is, do you think that in the foreseeable future, uh, is technology getting to the point where machines could actually think? Where we'll start thinking about autonomous weapon systems and independent weapon systems. And the rationale behind all this is, I've got three kids. Should I send them towards robotics or could I keep them uh, at, uh, let's say, law faculty? Or should I kind of like diversify the risk? Thank you. I think robotics. In terms of uh, your if question, um, I don't answer if questions. I don't see any sign of machines thinking. Uh, people have been talking about it for a very long time. I don't see any sign of machine sentience. It's a, it's a sort of uh, cultural narrative of science fiction that's permeated us for, for maybe 100, well, since 1921, in fact, when Carl Capek came up with the word robot and had robots that were kind of organic beings. They weren't like, you know, our metal things. But having programmed robots for many, many, many years, uh, I can't see, they're just big calculators, really. And you can do very clever things with them. And if you get into the game of when they can think then, then that doesn't make any sense to me. It's like saying um, when we can dig into this, when we tunnel right through the earth from one side to the other, when we can do that, won't travel to Australia be much easier. So, I mean, you can, once you, once you use an if in an argument, anything goes. I'm Diego, a Pecho trainee for uh, the ICRC, recently joined to the ICRC. Um, recently, the UN, uh, the UN report mentioned uh, a casualty of a uh, tribal elder, well, three years ago, a tribal elders group were uh, striked by a drone. Um, and the, rep uh, the special rapporteur actually commented that lack of situational awareness of drones, uh, well, drones oper op operators. Would you consider any other prevention activity or initiative that, that must at least reduce the casualties in these cases? Just remember, uh, either you plead in favor of making love, not war, or you suggest, which is a good suggestion, that there is no armed conflict in the tribal area. Or, if you consider it an armed conflict, the alternative would, have, uh, would be a ground operation by Marines. I'm not sure that there would be less uh, casualties if there were ground operations by Marines in the tribal areas. So there are, indeed, if there are civilian casualties, this does. Unfortunately, uh, I would like a law which prohibits any civilian casualty. This is not the law. It's not necessarily a violation of the law. Perhaps there are even violations of the law, but I'm totally convinced that there are less violations of the law in an armed conflict if drones are used than Marines or bombers. So, but because what it's being kept secret, I mean, the, the US CIA, for instance, quite obviously know a lot of the time when they've made errors. They know that people have been killed. There have been lots of reports on it. And there are campaigns going on at the moment saying that all the names of the dead should be revealed at all times so that we know who are the yeah, civilian casualties. But that's nothing to do with making love or war or anything else or, or Marines going in. Of course, in all armed conflict, but he's asking a specific question in this case, which is, should they not have revealed who had been killed? But again, the problem is because we're dealing with law enforcement. The CIA has nothing to do with the US armed forces. And actually, if I think about it, also um, international criminal tribunals or even the military justice, as soon as we have to collect information from intelligence, we have a major problem because they come up with a conf confidentiality issue. So um, that's, that's a major problem related to this kind of operations that do not really fit into the armed conflict scenario. Also from the ICRC, 
I'm sorry for dominating the discussion. I had a question for Professor Sharkey. It's kind of simplistic and it's maybe conceptual, but it would help a lot for lawyers to know how to talk about cyber warfare in a way that makes it easy for us to understand and to explain. And I was really um, struck by you saying that we talk about cyberspace and maybe that's not the right analogy. And I wondered if you had a better analogy as a scientist for us to use when we talk about cyber warfare. No, I don't. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't. Uh, but it's worth exploring the metaphor uh, quite a lot because you start talking about territory and I've heard dis military discussions about the idea that if you use my computer to link into someone else's, which is what happens, um, then that's like uh, driving tanks from um, Canada through the United States to attack Mexico. So it's like, it's like taking this notion of cyberspace taking it really, really literally and treating it as if it had some sort of existence. I mean, it's a lot of wires going around the place to different nets. I mean, we had a case, and wh where's the attack being done? We had a case of a young autistic man in the United Kingdom um, who attacked a, you know, he didn't know what he was doing, but he knew how to work computers very well, but he logged into an American battleship and did $100,000 worth of damage with winging of a gun about. And I wondered at the time, where did he actually do that crime? Because he was in his mother's house in Newcastle in the UK, upstairs, and yet he was going to be extradited to the United States to face trial because he had done the crime in the United States. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure how that works at all. You're looking at but, me for an answer. Well, I'm, just, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, you know, it's worth... I don't have a good alternative, but it's really worth exploring what, what the alternative would be. The only alternative I can give is telephone lines. So if I commit a fraud by calling someone on a telephone line and I'm in the United States and they're in Switzerland, where was that fraud committed? Sir, you had a question. Otto Hieronymi from Webster University. Uh, there's one question that has not really been discussed is what do these new technologies offer, for example, cyber war, but also drones or handheld missiles for non-legitimate uh, parties to a uh, conflict? Uh, what, to use the current term, to terrorists? Because obviously, international humanitarian law, international law, uh, condense all acts of violence by not legitimate parties. Now, uh, we have seen, we still don't know whether that Malaysian plane was victim of an accident or of a test uh, by a non-legitimate uh, party. And I think that probably is both a technological issue but also a highly a political and legal issue. I think that's an excellent question. I'm sorry we didn't cover that because that's talked about an awful lot. But of course, when it comes to the use of this technology, once the technology, I mean, the United States, for instance, will try and make a technology that will pass its weapons reviews. But once it's been made, it's very, very easy. It's very difficult to think up these things and be creative and actually design them. But once they're there, they're quite easy to make bad copies of, very easy. And of course, if you're a terror organization, you're not too bothered about discrimination, you know, proportionality or anything else. And I think they just lag a little bit behind. So eventually catch up. We haven't seen any attacks with robots from terrorist organizations. I don't know if we've had any cyber attacks or not, because how would you know? You could never tell. I mean, we do. We don't call them terrorist organizations. You call them WikiLeaks or something, you know. But there are lots of distributed denial attacks on on websites. Whenever somebody, whenever somebody attacked uh, Julian, Julian Assange, Assange. Um, their 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 sites were shut down by people just doing distributed denial. And I, I don't know if you could call that a terrorist attack, but it was certainly non-state actors. So I think that you've pointed to for me, a really, really major problem with all of this technology. Not to mention the fact that, you know, you develop all these autonomous weapons and you're worried about state actors. Do you think the CIA won't get their hands on it? And look what they've done with drones. I mean, come on. My name is Miriam Aquilo. I'm from Geneva Co. Uh, most of the panelists emphasize the importance to have what you call a weapon legal review. 
And I, as a just civilian and totally ignorant about these issues, I don't believe that states would be willing to undertake really such review in a very like, genuine manner for conflict of interest, but also for issues of uh, human resources, financial resources, and expertise. So I'm wondering, is there any uh, like international body, committee, multidisciplinary, that could make an inventory of the new technologies for warfare, that could follow the development of these new technologies and make some policy guidelines and conventions to prohibit some of these uh, new technologies for warfare? I think your problem is that international law tends to be state-based. And I think states are increasingly reluctant to agree to new law relating to particular technologies and relating to, indeed, the conduct of hostilities in general. Witness the fact that uh, 1977 was when we had the large, last major update. And it's with that... Um, appreciation by me, as it were, of uh, the concerns that states have and their sensitivity that I seek to argue not for new law, but for um, something between soft law and soft, soft law. Um, because uh, I don't see the merit in arguing for the unrealistic. Um, I think rather better confronted with a series of issues is to try to go for something where one feels that states would be inclined to take part. Now, I acknowledge that what you're opening up is, if you'll excuse the expression, a huge hornet's nest, which could potentially keep us all going until midnight and well beyond. Um, but that's my take on the answer. Um, but others will undoubtedly feel that we ought to be striving for something more in the way of law. Um, I just think that states don't want it. And whether you would receive an answer no, or non, or niet, or nine, I don't know. But it would take, in my view, one of those forms. Maybe if I can just complete on one word, because you mentioned whether there needs to be a fora for that. One exists, whether it works well, whether it's perfect, whether it's appropriate and sufficient. That's a good question in another debate. But one exists is the convention on the CCW, uh, uh, which have issued five protocols on weapons since uh, 1980. So after the, uh, the uh, um, additional protocols, and which have banned one new technology weapon in the sense that a weapon which had never been used in the field before, which is the blinding laser weapons. So at least one forum exists. Whether it's sufficient or not, that's, uh, uh, whether it brings good results, uh, uh, that's another question. But as Bill mentioned, it's for states to decide, and at least that's the forum they have established for that. If I may also, one word maybe to answer another question before on cyber warfare and a bit of the discussion on WikiLeaks and all of that. Uh, let's be clear then when we speak about cyber warfare and cyber attack in the media, uh, uh, that's very often things which are nothing what we talk about here. It's not in an armed conflict, it's not regulated by international humanitarian law. Uh, when we at the ICRC talk about cyber warfare, it's when you use in an armed conflict something to carry out an attack, and this something in cyber warfare is basically a code. When you use a code to carry out an attack, to have, uh, for example, to create death or destruction, and then there is a long discussion on whether you stop the functionality of an object, that's already an attack, but basically, to know what you talk about is using a code, and when it's uh, when I shall apply, it's only when it's uh, done within an armed conflict. Thank you. Uh, the panelists first they asked me to share their dreams. Now they asked me to share sentences and just one word. No, one more word. Well, it'd be, be a whole sentence actually. <laughs> um, one thing I have agreed with an awful lot that Bill has said at the end there, but I really don't like the idea of it would be unrealistic to think that. It would be unrealistic to think that there should never be an end to war, but I actually think there should be. And I think while you think it's unrealistic, you'll never do anything. Mankind can never evolve. Ne mankind can, can, can't get out of bed if you start saying it's unrealistic to think that we can't have a body that will stop 
kinds of weapons. And I think we should strive for those things and not think it's unrealistic. It would be unrealistic for me to be an Olympic champion, but I might want to strive for it and I might get a long way in doing it. I certainly wouldn't die of heart disease so quickly. Any other encouraging words? Roberta? No? No, I just would like to thank Professor Sully for having um, highlighted the fact that we shouldn't maybe look at new technologies just in a negative manner. We should also look at the beneficial aspects thereof. We didn't get a chance today, um, but maybe that's an idea for a different panel. And thank you very much for sharing your dreams and realistic <laughs> views with, with me. Perhaps one more good news. Uh, in the CCW process in two months, there will be an expert meeting precisely on, well, not precisely on all these issues, but on one of the issues, which is autonomous weapons. So states are at least ready to discuss these issues. And I think if they don't have the impression that you have a preconceived idea that all this is bad, but say, OK, how do you uh, want to deal with these issues. Somehow, as uh, you deal with armed groups, not excluding them, but including them. So you have to include states by telling them, okay, tell us how you plan to respect IHL with these um, new technologies. I think then a dialogue is possible. I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to thank you for this discussion. Um, I think it has been worthy for, to be an opening panel for a so important and timely cycle of, of debate and research as, as we will have it uh, now in the coming months. It's been a privilege listening to you, to uh, sit here among you and have this discussion. Luckily, I don't have to come to a conclusion now because it's an opening panel. It will be the concluding panel that's really tough to have the concluding remarks. Um, I've asked the question whether we are now witnessing a new de dehumanization of warfare and whether it needs a new response. And, and, and I have been thinking that this whole thing of humane warfare is a bit of a contradiction in terms anyway, and perhaps pulling out the human being of warfare is the most humane thing you can do. But again, it's a question I pose. I think there's more discussions to be had on the specific technologies, like cyber warfare, like autonomous systems, that uh, raise a lot of problems we cannot underestimate, and not just legal ones, also uh, humanitarian ones, real life problems that we are likely to face if we don't uh, take appropriate steps now, and which these steps uh, are going to be is, is still open for discussion. For now, I'd like to, uh, uh, to ask you to join me in an applause for our panelists and for all of you for this great discussion. And as I promised, as I promised, there are drinks just outside the door. You can't miss them if you don't go the wrong way. Thank you. <laughs>